Good evening, everyone. On behalf of the Department of Philosophy and Studium Generale, uh, it's an enormous honor for me uh, to welcome and introduce uh, the well-known Professor Kwame Antoni Appia, I hope I did that well, <laughs> um, to our university. Uh, Professor Appia unifies many identities in himself, that of an academic philosopher, first and for foremost, a theoretical one, a moral one, and a polit political one, political philosopher. Uh, also a popular philosophy publicist, a multi-prize multi winner, a multi-prize and award winner. You can, I probably have already done, so Googled this already. A married, uh, category of married, <laughs> and like myself, what in Dutch has long been called a uh, halfbloedje. I forgot to check how we call that in English, but uh, I think you can, cannot say that anymore now. Uh, it's someone from a Ghanaian, British, American descent. Uh, what to do and think uh, about such identities is what he uh, will be lecturing about. So once all, all of you have silenced their phones, I will gladly give the floor to you. Uh, thank you very much for that kind introduction. I'm delighted to be here with you all in Tilburg. And uh, uh, I've been here before, but um, so long ago that some of you weren't born. <laughs> uh, so it's good to be back. So I've learned over my many years in philosophy that Aristotle got a lot of things right. One of his excellent ideas was that there's an important subject called ethics which asks the question, what is it to live well? Or what is it to have a, a good human life? Uh, Aristotle said that people who, who lived well had something that he called eudaimonia, though he almost certainly didn't pronounce it that way, uh, which is sometimes translated as happiness. Um, And uh, that, that isn't a very good translation into modern English because uh, happiness, the word happiness now has the sense of a particular sort of positive feeling. And not everything about living well has something to do with how you feel, with how you're feeling great. Part of living well, for example, is succeeding in the projects you care about. And that's not just a matter of feeling good about them, it's a matter of actually achieving something which you may or may not feel good about. For example, you may be asleep uh, when one of your projects succeeds and then you don't feel anything about it. So like many philosophers, I prefer to translate eudaimonia as flourishing or as I did just now, I, just to speak of living well. Um, one element of Aristotle's answer uh, to the question, how do you live well? And this is another good idea, I think, is that we uh, humans uh, live well only in community. He put that by saying that we're a zoon politicon, a creature of the polis, an animal of the polis, where the polis, of course, was the city-state that was the form of organized society that he lived in while he was in Athens. As you know, he was born in Macedon, but he, he studied with Plato in Athens, and he then started his own school in Athens, so he spent much of his life in Athens. And this idea uh, strikes me, too, as importantly right, that we are, as on political mirror, a creature of community, of society. When people talk about ethics these days, they're often asking questions about what people owe to other people, which is one of the great challenges of living in community as a zoon political. And if people talk about professional ethics, they're talking about the norms that govern particular rules, roles in people's working lives, as journalists or teachers or doctors or managers or as employees of businesses or not-for-profit organizations and organizations of other kinds. These questions are certainly among the questions you have to answer if you're going to decide how to live well. 
A person who's living well is giving other people their due, paying what they owe, doing their duty by others. If their job is a respectable job, keeping to the norms of their role in the job is also going to be part of living well. But uh, I prefer to follow my friend, the late Ronald Dworkin, in calling questions about how we should treat other people moral questions, keeping the word ethics for Aristotle's broader set of questions. And morality in this sense can't be all there is to ethics because to live well, you have not only to do right by other people, you have to take care of yourself and your own projects. And maybe one of the great challenges of ethics is how to balance our obligations to others with our own project. Um, and a plausible answer to the great Aristotelian question of how to live well, an answer also proposed by Ronald Dworkin, is that living well means successfully meeting the challenge set by three things. Um, your capacities, the circumstances into which you were born, and the projects that you yourself decide are important. Now, because each of us comes equipped with different talents, and we're all born into different circumstances, and because people choose their own projects, everybody therefore faces a distinct challenge. We face different challenges. There's no comparative measure, I think, that enables an assessment of whether my life or your life is going better. What matters in the end is not how we rank against other people, it's how we meet each of us our own challenge. And part of that challenge is recognizing our distinctive capacities, working out our own projects, as well as understanding what are and aren't the legitimate claims of other people, but maybe also of other organisms, maybe even of the natural environment as well. So there are many claims on us. Philosophers contribute, I think, to public dis discussions of moral and political life, not by telling people what to think, but by providing an assortment of concepts and theories that can, people can use to decide what to think for themselves. And my main task today will be to try to make a contribution to that project as it relates to one particular set of ideas. But I want to say at the start that though I'm going to be making lots of claims, you should recognize that however forcefully I make them, I'm offering them up just for your consideration in the light of your own knowledge and experience. And so I think of myself as trying to start a conversation, not to end one. And one thing that Aristotle said uh, about the generalizations of ethics that I think is also true, he said they're true for the most part. They tend not to be exceptionless, the generalizations of ethics. So, and I agree with that. So uh, if I say something general uh, and you think of an, an, an exception, that may not worry me too much. And so you should certainly bear that in mind as you listen to what I have to say. So I want to talk about one set of resources in living our lives, uh, and that is such things as uh, gender and sexual orientation, nationality, culture, race, ethnicity, religion, profession, in short, all our social identities. I've spent a good deal of time over the last four decades thinking about how these identities fit into our ethical lives. I, I wrote a book uh, more than a quarter century ago, um, so long ago, that I came to Tilburg after writing it, uh, <laughs> uh, called uh, In My Father's House, that was in part about racial and national identities, especially in Africa and among people of African descent in the African diaspora. Uh, in 2005, I published a book uh, about the ethics of identity, and then, like a responsible philosopher, I published a book a decade and a half later whose subtitle was Rethinking Identity, which reflects some of the ways I changed my mind about what I said in those earlier books. And the title of that book was The Lies That Bind. Uh, I can't do Dutch, but there's a Dutch translation which is called something like Die Lugen die uns binden, or something like that. <laughs> what? That, that sounded very German, yes. The German edition is called something else. Uh, anyway, the aim of the book was to use its stories as well as arguments to explore some lessons about uh, uh, gender and creed and color and so on. Now, one reason I've spent a good deal of time reflecting on identity is that my own has sometimes puzzled other people. Uh, in a typical such moment, 
let's say, a brown-skinned man gets into a cab and talks with a vaguely British accent. That's me. And if the driver has brown skin too, he or she is often trying, I suspect, to see if we have some sort of affinity to, as it were, they're worried about whether we're brown for the same reason. Uh, so in Britain and in Abu Dhabi, there are South Asians who tried their Hindi on me. And the brown-skinned Parisian, who thought I might be from Belgium, thus insulting my French accent, perhaps took me for a fellow Maghrebi. And in recent years, I've had conversations with Sikhs and an Egyptian from Upper Egypt, from near Aswan, in taxi drivers from New York. And they ask me, the, the way they get into this usually is they say, where were you born? Uh, that turns out not to be a very helpful way of approaching the matter. I, w I was born in London, uh, but that doesn't really explain why I'm brown. Uh, what they meant to ask, of course, was where my family came from originally. Uh, of course, all our families originally came from East Africa, but never mind. Uh, but more bluntly, they could have asked me, what are you? And that is the what of identity. Now, the answer in my case to the question of origins, the where question, if not exactly the what question, is that I come from two families in two places pretty far apart. By the time I was born, my mother had been lived in London off and on since her childhood, but her real home was far away in atmosphere, if not in kilometers, on the edge of the Cotswold Hills, where she grew up on a farm in a tiny and ridiculously picturesque English village on the border of Oxfordshire and Gloucestershire. There really are many cottages in Tolkien's where she was born that look like that. As a result, while my mother was, in a sense, a Londoner when I was born, she was at heart a countrywoman who just happened to work in London, a West Country woman. And though she'd spent a fair amount of time living abroad uh, during and after the Second World War in Russia and Iran and Switzerland, um, uh, she still thought of herself fundamentally as a woman from the West Country. Not surprisingly, however, given those international experiences, she found a job at an organization in London that was working for uh, harmony, racial harmony in Britain, and his empire, uh, largely by supporting colonial students in London. And, and the organization was called Racial Unity. So she worked for an organization called Racial Unity. That was how she met my father, because he was a colonial student in London. Uh, in, he was a colonial student from what was then the Gold Coast, uh, now Ghana, of course. He was an anti-colonial activist. He used to go to Hyde Park Corner in London and complain about British imperialism, even during the war. Uh, <laughs> Uh, he was a representative in Britain for a while of Dr. Kwame Nkrumah, who was to lead Ghana to independence in 1957, uh, a little bit after I was born. So you could say that my mother practiced what she preached. She practiced racial unity. The other side of my family then came from Ghana, more precisely from Asante, a region in the heart of the modern Republic of Ghana, where he was born in this town, Kumasi which is the capital of Asante and has been since the early 18th century. My father's lineage, his family as he taught us, could be traced back to a man called Akramampem, an 18th century general whose successes in battle won him the right to a large tract of land on the kingdom's edge. Um, this is 19th century. I don't have any 18th century pictures of Asante. This is a drawing done by a a visiting uh, British military officer who, who wrote a book called Mission to Asante, Ashanti in, um, in the early 19th century. So this is the earliest picture I know of of, of Ashanti. Um, so my, as I say, I, the, 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 he, this ancestor of, of my father's was a member of a military aristocracy that created the Asante Empire, which dominated the region for two centuries. And his name is one of the names my parents gave me, so you can call me Akramampim if you like. Um, and my father raised us with stories of this man and people in between now and then in our family. Now, my book, The Lies That Bind, is full of family stories because I wanted to explore the ways in which narratives like these, which locate us in a history and a family and so on, shape our sense of who we are. Each person's sense of self is bound to be shaped 
by their own background, beginning with family, but spreading out in many directions. To nationality, which binds us to a territory, to gender, which connects most of us with roughly half the species, and to categories of class and sexuality and race and religion, which all transcend our local affiliations. So there are five chapters in the book devoted to uh, one, each devoted to one species of identity, uh, and, and, the, and then the first one, general chapter, uh, says a lot about gender. Uh, so, and the, the five are creed, country, color, class, and culture, the five C's. So one question is, what do all these have in common? That's a philosopher's question. How, in short, do identities like these come into being? Um, this use of the word identity is an entirely post-Second World War phenomenon. You do not find the word identity used in this way to refer to gender and race and sexuality and so on. Uh, I, I looked. You can do that now because you can use Google Books and you can go looking. For, and the word identity occurs in earlier social science, but it doesn't occur with this sense. It really arises, in, as I say, in the 1950s, after the Second World War. Um, and so uh, I, I have, want to give a philosopher's answer to the question, what are identities and why do they matter? So my main message about the five forms of identity is, in effect, that we're living with the legacies of ways of thinking that took their modern shape in the 19th century and that it's a good idea to subject them to the best thinking of the 21st century. The European and American intellectuals who founded modern anthropology, for example, in the later 19th century, tended to think of religion, one of my categories, creed, as essentially about the things people believe, creeds, credo, I believe, or credimus, we believe. And that idea has percolated into the general culture. Uh, but I argue that the heart of religious life across space and time are matters other than creed, and that once you see that creeds are not so central, you also have to accept that scriptures as sources of belief matter less than many people have thought. When it comes to modern states, nation, shaped by a form of nationalism that also arose through the 19th century, Law and common sense suggest that peoples have a right to determine their own fates. We speak of self-determination and autonomy, about independence and freedom, as my father did for the Gold Coast. But there's something wrong, I think, with our models here, too, starting with the answers we've given to a fundamental question, which is what makes a collection of people into a nation? Uh, race has been a source of trouble in human affairs since the contours of the modern way of thinking about it became dimly visible in the rise of new scientific ideas about human beings as part of the natural world uh, it, through the 19th century. Um, I believe the word biology was coined in 1800. So the, this new biological way of thinking about human beings was... Uh, the result of a revolution that produced a new field. Um, uh, it's going to German, Biologie. So these ideas, as I say, grew explosively in the 19th century, as did the cultural authority of biology, this new science of life. Much of the elaborate scientific superstructure that grew up around race was dismantled in the 20th century as anthropologists and biologists worked out the implications of ideas from Darwin and Mendel and discovery upon discovery was made in evolutionary theory, population biology, and genetics. But the world outside the sciences hasn't taken as much notice as I think it should have of those changes. Too many people remain captive to perilous misunderstandings about the connection between color, to use a word to cover all the sort of detectable, easily detectable uh, surface phenotypes of people, uh, misunderstandings about the connection between those things and what really matters about human beings. Uh, the issue with class, I think, is not so much that we have a picture of it that's mistaken, but that we operate with a set of pictures that is incoherent and inconsistent. And meritocracy, the most influential solution that has been devised for the problems posed by class, like the biological practices of many 18th century physicians 
often makes the situation worse rather than better. And finally, we also make many mistakes about our broader cultural identities, including Western identity, and that was the last of my test cases. So in each of these five cases, we have a tendency towards what uh, psychologists call essentialism, slightly different from what philosophers call essentialism. We too often make the mistake of supposing that at the core of each identity, there has to be some deep similarity that binds the people of that identity together and that explains why the members of the group are centrally the way they are. I don't think that's true. I think it's not true in any of these cases, and I think it's not true for almost every case of an important identity. So there's no dispensing with identities. We, we need them, but we need to understand them better if we hope, can hope to reconfigure them and free ourselves from mistakes about them that are often a couple of hundred years old. Much of what is dangerous about them has to do with the way identities, religion, nation, race, class, and culture divide us and set us against one another. They can be the enemies of solidarity, the sources of war, horsemen of a score of apocalypses from apartheid to genocide. Yet these errors are also central to the way identities unite us today. We need to reform them because at their best, they make it possible for groups, large and small, to do things together. So they are the lies that bind. So I want to spend some time with you today talking about the difficulty there is in pinning down the exact content of particular forms of identity talk. That's important if you're going to try and uh, move discussions of identity, especially across societies, to, to be able to talk across societies about identities and to translate uh, identity talk from one place to another. Translate both in the, in the sense of uh, move something from one language to another, but also just in the sense uh, the etymological sense of translate, which of course comes from transferi, which just means to move something across from one place to another. And to see what the problem is here, let me give uh, my first example, which is uh, some North American conceptions of racial identity. Uh, now, the words uh, Latino and Hispanic are in wide circulation in contemporary North American talk. So, as you know, are black, white, African American, Caucasian, Anglo, Asian, Asian American, Indian, Native American, Arab, and a whole host of other terms for ethnic or racial groups. If you asked for an explanation of these terms, pretending to be, or perhaps for that matter, actually being an ignorant foreigner, uh, trying to make your way into our society, you would get a whole range of incompatible responses. It's easy to imagine a conversation that might go like this. I'm not expecting you to read this. It's just putting that up there so that you... I, I'm going to read it out loud to you so you don't have to read it for yourselves. So I'm imagining a conversation between these four characters. John says, Latino, black, white, Asian, Indian, and Arab are all races. Mary says, no, they're not. She says, race is a social construct. These are just names for ethnic groups that some people think are biologically distinguishable. Uh, Arabs, Mary says, can be like Latinos of any color. Bless you. Uh, just go to Sudan. You'll see Arabs of every skin shape. People who call themselves Arabs, speak Arabic. Some of them are as dark as my West African father. In fact, darker and some are the same sort of color as you are. James, however, now steps in. He says, wait a minute. Most people don't think Latinos are a race at all. How many people in here think Latinos are a race? Nobody. Well, uh, two-fifths of Latinos think Latino is a race. At least that's what they say if you ask them in the United States. And John says, but that's ridiculous. Everybody knows that Latinos are of mixed European, Native American, and African ancestry. And now Anne enters the conversation again and says, what do you mean African? Are you telling me that, some, that Mexicans are black? Well, obviously, most Mexicans don't think they're black, but some do. That's why, Mary says, I said they're ethnic groups, social constructs. It depends on what the society does with these labels. 
John then says, I bet you can't explain to me what your so-called ethnic groups are constructed out of, you said they're a social construct, without talking about biology, without talking about biological differences. And Mary says, well, I only need to talk about beliefs about biological differences since the beliefs don't need to be true for them to be socially important. I don't need to talk about actual differences. I just need to talk about the differences that people believe in. And by the way, she goes on, you left out some of the mess in the Latina case. For example, there are more than 1.5 million Japanese Brazilians living in Sao Paulo, which is the largest concentration of individuals of Japanese descent outside of Japan. I think it would be the third largest city in Japan, uh, or something like that. Uh, their descendants get to be members of the Latino ethnic groups if they come to the United States, though they probably speak Portuguese if they speak any Iberian language and not Spanish. So now James says, are you saying if some Mexican Indian who doesn't speak Spanish shows up for work in Iowa, he won't be Hispanic, and we can leave the conversation there? Because my interest isn't in whether any of these people is right, but in a different issue that suggests itself as one listens to conversations like these, which occur, at least in, they occur in classrooms if you ask people to think about these things. This is the sort of conversation you get. On the one hand, people clearly use lots of ethno-racial terms to identify people. That's the thing I started with, the fact I started with. And they also agree over a wide range of cases on the application of those terms. Lots of people agree that Dr. Martin Luther King was black. Lots of people think that Bill Clinton was white, and so on. And they can give you a long list of people in all these categories. And most people will agree with a lot of the people on those lists. So they agree uh, on what a philosopher would call the extension of the predicate black or the predicate white, right? the property term applies to some things, the class of things it applies to is the extension. Lots of people agree about the extension of these terms. Um, on the other hand, they're much less likely to agree uh, about how they are making these allocations of people to the categories, and they're much less likely to agree about what the significance is of these classificatory terms, as we saw in that imaginary conversation. At the beginning of modern philosophy of language, Gottlob Frege proposed an account of the words used to ascribe properties, predicates, as I said. That's what we philosophers call them. And on that account, people who understand a property term like, say, the term black, associate each such word with what he called a zin, a sense, uh, which he, he described as a way of determining the class of things that had the property, uh, he, his word for extension was vidoito, the, the reference. It's an elementary, f uh, <laughs> it's an interesting fact, of course, since many of you here know German, that zin and vidoito might be thought of as um, synonyms by many Germans. They're just two ways of talking about meaning. But uh, we're distinguishing between the way we fix the reference, the way we decide what's in the class, that's the zin, and what is in the class. That's the class of things. That's the bedeutung. Now, it's an elementary fact which makes trouble for Fragian accounts of meaning that many of our ethno-racial predicates simply don't have anything like a public zin, a sense. That is, they do not have shared public modes of determining the class of things they apply to. People disagree about how to apply the terms. Worse, people actually ascribe these properties to people on the basis of ideas that are not only different, but at least superficially inconsistent with one another. You just imagine for you, I just imagine for your conversation about race, everybody thought they were talking about race, but some of them didn't think there were any, and others did. Well, those can't, they can't both be right, um, at least uh, if they're using the word with the same meaning in one sense. Now, it could, of course, be that they just are using the word with, uh, that they just mean different things by the word race. I mean, the word race in English does mean at least two things, right? It means this thing, and then it means what people do at the Olympics. Um, so maybe you might think it's like that. But I think in at least one of the many senses of the very multivalent word mean, 
they could certainly all be said to know what the English word race means, because in that sense, to know what the word means is just to have sufficient knowledge to use the word properly so that when people disagree with you, they don't say, you don't know what you're talking about. They say, you're wrong. And so far as I can see, all the people in that conversation can count as knowing what the word race means. So if, if they're wrong about something, it's not semantics, it's something else. It's, it's as it were, the truth. So in sum, identity labels are grasped by people who have some ideas about how to apply them, but that doesn't mean that they have to have the same ideas. Um, uh, you no doubt have had the same difficult conversations about Palestine and Zionism here as everybody else has. Well, Zionism is the view that uh, Israel should be a Jewish state. But what does Jewish mean in there? People disagree. Is it a religious term? Is it, an, is it a, a term describing a, a, an ancestral group defined by descent? Uh, is, it a, is it a cultural, uh, uh, cultural notion? One of the early modern Zionists said that uh, Judaism was the folk religion of the Jewish people. So he took it that he took it that the Jewish people could be identified independently of Judaism, and so on. So, but look, uh, everybody agrees that Bibi Netanyahu is Jewish, and there's a long list of people that we can agree are Jewish. So there's a lot of agreement on the extension of the term, even if there's a lot of disagreement about how we're applying it. So what the labels mean in another sense is obviously different for different people. And so I want to sketch an account of social identity that I use in my own thinking about these questions that allows for that fact. This explication of social identities derives from an account of them once offered by the philosopher Ian Hacking since in this context we're talking about identity, I should perhaps say the Canadian philosopher, Ian Hacking, uh, though he once taught at, uh, in Paris. Um, and his account he called dynamic nominalism. Now, it's nominalist because you explain how the identities work by talking about the labels for them. Nomen is the Latin for name. So nominalism is a view that you, when you're giving an account of concept, you need to do so in a way that refers explicitly to the labels. So, take a representative uh, label uh, for uh, um, I'm going to be a boring philosopher and call it X. Uh, I could have invented some fancy name for it, but let's just say X. Um, and here's uh, something I want to say about what it is for there to be an identity. Uh, and as I say, it's a nominalist account because it starts by talking about how the term for the identity, the name for the identity, works. So, first, there are criteria of ascription for the term X. Second, some people will identify as X's. Third, some people will treat other people as X's. And finally, there will be what I'm going to call norms of identification for X's. Now, every one of those italicized expressions needs explanation, so that's what I'm going to do next. Um, a person's criteria of ascription for a word like woman are the properties on the basis of which she sorts people into those to whom she does and those to whom she doesn't apply the term. The criteria of ascription need not be the same for every user of the term. That's the point I've been stressing about um, identity terms. Indeed, there's rarely a socially shared set of properties that are individually necessary and jointly sufficient for being an X. So what do the user's understandings have to have in common to count as users of the same term with the same, for the same identity? Well, let me give as the example uh, what characterizes competence with a term like black or white used as racial terms. So this is what I believe is the right story about how people who use these terms correctly use them. Um, first, there will be certain kinds of people, we can call them prototypical blacks or prototypical whites, such that your criteria of ascription must pick them out as black or white. If somebody claims to know what black means but presented with all the relevant facts about Dr. Martin Luther King says, oh, he's not black, we can reasonably assume that they don't know what they're talking about. 
So there's going to be a bunch of people who, who uh, are going to be, as it were, taken in the community to be paradigms of what's black. And I'm going to call those prototypical blacks, and they'll be prototypical whites. Again, um, knowing whatever you need to know about Bill Clinton, if you think he's not white, you're mistaken. And, uh, and that displays a failure to grasp something about the concept, uh, even though my friend... <laughs> Uh, Tony Morrison used to refer to Bill Clinton as the first black president of the United States, uh, but that had to do with his character and his cultural characteristics, not with his race, his, his ancestry. Um, all right, so you've got to include the prototypes. You, you, the way you do it has to include the prototypes, otherwise you don't count as having competence with, with the concept. Now, there'll also be other kinds, let's, I'm going to call them anti-types, uh, that your criteria of ascription must exclude. Again, if you apply, you're given all the relevant information about Bill Clinton and you say, oh, he's obviously not white, you don't understand how white works. Uh, now, in the case of the uh, sort of Latino, Hispanic categories, a Cuban American, most of whose ancestors came to Cuba before the 18th century and who arrived in Florida in 1950, is a prototype of a Latino. A European or African who doesn't speak Spanish or Portuguese, doesn't come from the Iberian Peninsula or Latin America, is an antitype. Those are people who can't be Latino. So if you list all the prototypes and antitypes of black and you find, here's what you'll find, they don't divide the world into two classes. Right? That is, there are people who will be black on some people's account and not on others, and there'll be people who will be white on some people's account and not on others. I'll give you examples in a minute if that's not clear. Uh, um, so they may think that the way they use these terms divides the world into two classes, uh, but in fact it doesn't. So there's what I'm going to call a neutral class of people who don't fit very well into the categories, who may count as black for some people, uh, white for other people, or... Um, presented with them, some people may say, well, I'm not sure what to say. I, I, I don't know. Um, all right. So let's say that someone who has criteria of ascription for an identity term X that meets the conditions for competence, that, that captures the prototypes and the antitypes, has a conception of a black person or of an X, right? Now, this is all very abstract, so let me give you an example. Take the term Asian as used by Joe Kansas, so Joe from Kansas, who has met very few people from anywhere in Asia and very few Asian Americans too. Joe says Asians are a race, and he ascribes the term Asian to everyone who looks a certain way. In fact, he ascribes it to everyone who he thinks looks like uh, one of the movie stars in a Hong Kong movie. Uh, so I'm going to call looking like that, from Joe's point of view, as looking Asian to Joe. Joe also thinks that the label is properly applied to anyone whose ancestors for many generations have come from China or Japan because he supposes that everybody in those countries would look Asian to him. So here are some facts about the North American English term Asian that Joe need not know. He need not know that not everyone from the Asian continent is a prototypical Asian. He need not know, for example, that most South Asians are not prototypical Asians. Most uh, South Asians will not look Asian to him because looking Asian to him means looking like that, like Bruce Lee. Um, he may not know that most Han Chinese will look Asian to him. And he may not know that the antitypes for Asian include most people who look African and most people who look European to him. He may not know that that's true about him. Now, our Kansan will get all the prototypes and antitypes right. If you give him a Han Chinese, he'll say Asian. If you give him a Finn or a Congolese, he'll say not Asian. So he's competent. But presented with a Kyrgyz or a Kazakh, or a Finnish Sami, people of whose existence he's completely unaware, 
he might not know what to say. So his conception has a neutral class. It has a class of people, even though he doesn't know this, that his uh, term doesn't know how to handle. And he has lots of false beliefs, no doubt. For example, he thinks that most, almost everyone in Asia, the continent, looks roughly the way many Han Chinese people look, even though most people in Asia do not. More than two billion Indians, Pakistanis, Sri Lankans, Vietnamese, uh, Thais, Laos, let alone um, anyone in one of the many Chinese ethnic minorities, um, uh, do not look, they don't all look like uh, Han people. Now it's worth noting, or they don't look like Bruce Lee, let's say. Um, It's worth noting two facts that explain why our Kansan can proceed with the criteria of the description he does, even though there's a large neutral class for his conception, and even though his conception is different from yours or mine. First, in his social world, there are very few people who look like any of these people, right? So he doesn't have to notice that his term is in difficulty because he doesn't, the world doesn't present him with the cases that make difficulty. So if he spent his time traveling with me to meet all these people, he might feel he had to modify his conception somehow. Or he might engage in what philosophers of language call semantic deference and say, well, I need to consult an expert to decide whether these people are Asian, though he might have no idea who the experts were. Right? He might, he might, he might think it was his doctor. Perhaps he might think it was an anthropologist. Perhaps he might think it was a, a dictionary maker, a lexicographer. A second reason he doesn't know he's in difficulty is this. Not only do people, different people have different conceptions of most social identities, their conceptions will often be statistically correlated and sociologically explicable in terms of the social identities they themselves bear. That's another reason why our Kansan need not notice that he has a different conception of what it is to be Asian from many other Americans. He only uses the term in a social circle in which people all have roughly the same conception. Now, over time, conceptions of an X can change. But if a term comes to be associated with significantly different prototypes and antitypes, then what we have is not a new conception of an identity, I think, but a new identity. So if, for example, Brazilians were to move from using their word negro to refer to people with black skin, as they do, to using it as, in the United States, the term black is used, which is to refer to people whose recent ancestors had black skin, that would be a change in, social, in the social identity. Negro would come to, as it were, coincide with African-American or black, which it doesn't right now. Because what was formerly just a matter of appearance, you get to be Negro just by looking a certain way, and that means that, um, unlike on the North American conception, two, uh, uh, two brothers, can, one of them can be Negro, two full biological siblings, uh, One of them can be Negro and the other not. It just depends on what they look like. That's not possible in the United States. In the United States, um, the way the the term black and white works, um, you're of the same race as your... If your parents are of the same race, you're of that race too. And therefore, you can't be of a different race from your full siblings. Okay. If I'm right about the centrality of labels and labeling to identity then there'll be, as I said, an interesting set of challenges associated with translating identities with finding terms in one language that adequately capture the same identity in another. I can't explain to you how Americans ascribe racial terms by giving the same explanation for every American, I've just argued. Worse, as with the US and Brazil, similar looking labels, black and negro, are both used also as the names of a color, the same color, Um, So they're both color terms, uh, but they turn out to operate differently when they come into the racial domain. And this difficulty deepens once we turn to thinking about the second element of my little theory of identity, uh, where I speak of identifying, of identification. By itself, a way of classifying people that works as I've suggested description works wouldn't produce what I'm calling a social identity. What makes it a social identity of the relevant kind is not just that people identify themselves or others as X's 
that is, know how to apply the label, but that being an X figures in a certain typical way in the thoughts, feelings, and acts of at least some of them. When a person thinks of herself as an X in the relevant way, she identifies as an X. And what this means is that she sometimes feels like an X or acts like an X. I'm going to leave that for later. An agent acts as an X when the thought, because I'm an X, figures in her reason for doing something. I'm going to do this because I'm a woman, because I'm black, because I'm gay. So, for example, if I'm in class and someone tells a homophobic joke, I tell them I don't think that's funny. Why do I feel I should tell them that? Well, one reason is that I am gay. So, of course, if you're not gay, you can't have that reason for saying that thing. Now, I hope you would say that thing, whether you're gay or not. I hope you would say it's not funny about a homophobic joke. But you can't say it because you're gay. So your identity has to figure differently in your reason for telling someone that a joke is homophobic from the response of someone who thinks they should do this because they're gay. Now, how people identify varies across people and across time. So no particular ways of acting or abstaining um, as an ex or feeling as an ex are part of the constitution of the social identity. What's required is only that there should be expressions of identification, but they're going to be different across time and space, and they're going to be typically different across individuals. So lots of people do things because they're men or because they're women, but what they do is different. And some people, I would like to leave you to invent the case for yourself, uh, some, some people will do things because they're a man, and other people will do them the very same thing because they're a woman, and some people will do something as a man that it doesn't make any sense to some other person, some other man, to think of as doing because they're a man. So there's variation uh, across the cases. All right. So you won't have a sense of the significance of an identity in a society unless you have some sense of the different ways in which people in that society express their identification, the sorts of things they might do on the basis of their thinking of themselves as a man, whatever. Now, a similar thing applies when we turn to the third matter that I said I needed to say more about, what I called treatment. To treat someone as an African-American, say, is to do something to them where, because that person is an African-American, figures in your reason for doing it to them. So Joe Kansas is in Rome. This is not a racial example. He sees a couple looking lost, and hears one of them say, uh, with an American accent, gee, honey, I wish I knew which way the Capitol was. Since Joe's just come from the Capitol, he goes up to them and he explains how to get there. Why? Because he's an American, he recognizes that they're American, and so he feels that's a reason for him to help them though they're lost, while they're lost in Rome. Now notice, Giuseppe Romano could also, who isn't an American, could also help them, but again, he couldn't help them for that reason. He couldn't help them because they're all Americans. All right, so I take description, um, identification, and treatment, in my view, for a label to be functioning as the label for a social identity of the sort that I'm trying to talk about. You need all those three elements. Now, one reason that these identities are useful in social life is that once we ascribe an identity to someone, we can often make predictions on that basis about what they will do or feel. This isn't just because the criteria of ascription entail that members of the group have certain properties, though that's true. It's because social identities are associated with norms of behavior for exes, and that's the final element of my philosophical explication of the notion. It's not just that people do and abstain from doing things because they are women, gay, black. There are things that, as exes, they think they ought and ought not to do. Now, the ought here is not the moral ought, if there is a moral ought, some people don't think there is, but um, it's not a particularly moral ought. So just look at this list of examples. Um, here's a list of norms of identification. Men 
want to uh, a, pos a positive one, and then, uh, uh, something you should do. You um, shouldn't do, sorry, men ought not to wear dresses, gay men shouldn't fall, fall in love with women, uh, blacks ought not, not to embarrass the race. And positively, men should open doors for women, gay people ought to come out, blacks ought to support affirmative action. Now, um, to say that these norms exist is evidently not to endorse them. I don't endorse any of these norms myself. I don't think any of these is, is a correct statement about what one ought to do. But uh, the existence of a norm that X is ought to A is just amounts to this, that it's widely thought and widely known to be thought that many people believe that X is ought to do A. And some of these are things that at least at some times and in some places many people have thought and many people have known that, every, that many people think. And I put it this way because I think that sometimes it turns out that hardly anybody actually believes in the norm, but everybody thinks that everybody else does, and sometimes that's an interesting discovery. Now, norms such as these can change without the associated identity changing. So an identity, again, isn't constituted by its norms. What's constitutive of a social identity is that there are norms of identification associated with it. There are ideas around about how you ought to behave if you're of that identity. And since the existence of the norm entails that it be widely believed that people think that X's ought to do such and such, uh, that is one reason why such social identities are useful. I don't endorse the first norm, men ought not to wear dresses, but I'm aware of it, and that is one of the reasons why I don't wear dresses, because I'd have to deal with the consequences of violating a norm. This depends on where you are, of course. Uh, it's, 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 a, it's a stronger norm in some places than others. Um, so these norms can, as it were, allow you to predict behavior, even the behavior of people who don't really agree with them, because the people who don't agree with them know that they exist, and so their behavior is shaped by the awareness that people will respond to them uh, in, a, in a negative way if they, if they violate them. All right, that's the account. In case you haven't noticed, Perhaps I should draw attention to the fact that a very wide range of labels for people fit the general rubric I've laid out. Uh, I started with racial names and ethnonyms. I mentioned genders, man, woman, non-binary, uh, trans. We've talked about a nationality, American. We've talked about a more local identity, Kansan. But I could also have mentioned Professional identities, lawyer, doctor, journalist, philosopher. Vocations like poet, composer, novelist, philosopher, again. Uh, some various kinds of formal and informal affiliations, for example, Manchester United fans, Juventus fans, uh, jazz aficionados, social democrats, Catholics, and also some area labels like dandy or cosmopolitan. And I'm observing this range, not just because like a well-bred philosopher, I'm interested in generality, but because this range invites an obvious question. Why do we have such a wide range of social identities? One answer, speaking as an ethicist, is that we use identities to make our human lives. We make our lives as men and as women and as non-binary people, we make them as Americans and Dutch people. We make them as Catholics and Jews. And uh, we make them as philosophers and novelists. We make them as fathers and daughters. The ethical task each of us has in virtue of our existence as a moral person is to construct a life and to try to make it go well. Morality, by which I mean remember what we owe to other people, is part of the scaffolding on which we make that construction. And so are various projects that we voluntarily undertake. Um, Voltaire's garden, the garden that he built uh, in the last part of his life, uh, was one of his projects, and he can spend a lot of time on it, which is why there's some resonance in the fact that Candide ends with the sentence, we should cultivate our garden. He, he, he knew what, of, of what he spoke when he said that. That was a big project. Um, but identities are another resource for making our lives. Because I'm a philosopher, there are things I need to get done in the course of my life if it's to go well. I need to develop a deeper understanding of something, some central or important questions about human 
intellectual or ethical life, or the nature of, the, the nature of things. This is an obligation, if it is one, fundamentally to myself as a philosopher. I entered into this identity gradually, so there was a time before I was a philosopher, there was a later time when I couldn't have said, and there's a time now where I'm sure that that is what I am. It doesn't seem to me exactly that I chose it, though, because I feel, as Socrates did, if you will excuse me for a moment if I sound pretentious, but this is actually what I feel, I feel that philosophy chose me. Identities are diverse and extensive, I think, because people need an enormous diversity of tools for making their lives. Each person needs many options. And people's, uh, people, because people are various, a range of options that would be quite sufficient for one of us won't be sufficient for others or for all of us. And in fact, people are constantly making new identities all the time. Gay, which I've mentioned already, is only three or four decades old as a form of identity. Um, I don't know if you have the concept of a goth. Do you have the concept of a goth? Well, that's even newer than that. As Mill said in one of my favorite passages from chapter three of On Liberty, which I often say is my favorite book, <laughs> um, if it were only that people have diversities of taste, that is reason enough for not attempting to shape them all after one model. But different persons also require different conditions for their spiritual development. The same things which are helps to one person towards the cultivation of his higher nature are hindrances to another. Unless there is a corresponding diversity of their modes of life, they neither obtain their fair share of happiness nor grow up to the mental, moral, and aesthetic stature of which their nature is capable. So far as I can see, all the evidence shows that we must have some social identities to live a human life. But it doesn't show that we have to have the ones we actually have, uh, or that we should just leave them as they are. For example, most people will have, not everybody, but many, most people will have sexual desires, and they'll be organized differentially around some features of other people. Uh, but though... Um, older Greek men famously had sex with male adolescents, they don't appear to have had the social identity homosexual, without which the social identity heterosexual doesn't make any sense. Many societies appear to have made a different distinction based not on the gender of the objects of your sexual desire, but on what you wanted to do with them or to them. So there's always a question to ask about any identity. Do you want to go on with it? Or shall we stop thinking of people in this way? Or shall we shift it in some way? Shall we reshape it. And that has happened, of course, for the reason I just gave. That's happened to conceptions of what we call sexuality. Um, and it's a key point that this is always a question you have to ask along with others in your community. Some we. All the labels that mark our identities belong to communities. They're a social possession. And morality and political prudence require us to try to make them work for everybody. Over the course of my lifetime, I have watched, learned from, and participated in the reshaping of what it means to be women and men, and sometimes neither a woman nor a man, in the various interconnected places that I have lived my life. Without the reshaping of gender that has increasingly liberated many of us from old patriarchal assumptions, I couldn't have lived my life as a gay man married to another man making a life in public and private ways together. This life has been made possible through other people's struggle on various scales, some large, some small, um, and by my taking small risks with friends and employers and family. If I had lived my life in Ghana, where I grew up, I would, like other lesbian and gay Ghanaians, have a long road still to travel. There's a lot of a rising tide of homophobia in Ghana right now. But in the meanwhile, women in Asante, where I also grew up, who were always more autonomous than women in many other parts of the world, have seen their options grow further and prosper, in part by recognizing that much that was once assumed impossible for women because they were women, because of what a woman essentially was, could be made possible, and that a world of empowered women is enriching for men as well. There's a liberal fantasy in which identities are merely chosen, so we're all free to be what we choose to be. But identities without demands wouldn't serve their ethical function. 
identities work only because once they get their grip on you, once you think of yourself as a certain kind, they command you. They speak to you as a kind of inner voice, the way uh, Socrates' uh, spirit spoke to him about being a philosopher. And because others, seeing who they think we are, they call on us too. They ask, they, through our identities, people make calls of solidarity on us. They ask us to do things together. If you don't care for the shape your identities have taken, you can't simply refuse them because they don't just belong to you. You have to work with others inside and outside the label group in order to reframe them so that they fit you better and you can only do that collective work if you recognize that the results must serve other people as well. And I think the way that the trans movement has, has, has done this is, is, is exemplary. They, they understand that they're not just asking for something themselves, they understand that they're asking to change a system and they want the system that results to suit everybody, including cis people. They're not, they're not trying to create a system that only works for them. Now, the modes of identity I considered in my book can all become forms of confinement, but they can also give contours to our freedom as identities as women, working class people, LGBTQI people, and so on, national identities, religious identities, have done in struggles all around the world. Women work together across class and language and religion and nation in a global struggle against oppression and inequality. Social identities connect the small scale where we live our lives alongside our kith and kin, our families and friends, with larger movements, larger causes, larger concerns. They can make a wider world intelligible, alive, and urgent. They can expand our horizons to communities larger than the ones we personally inhabit. Most of our identities connect us with tens of millions, hundreds of millions, billions of strangers. And our lives have to make sense at the largest of scales as well. We live in an age in which our actions in the realm of thought as well as in the realm of technology and action increasingly have global effects. If you had forgotten that, the COVID pandemic reminded us. So when it comes to the compass of our compassion and our concern, humanity as a whole is not too broad a horizon. We live with eight billion fellow humans on a small warming planet. The cosmopolitan impulse that draws on our common humanity is no longer a luxury, it's become a necessity. And in encapsulating that ancient ideal, I want to draw on a slave, the words of a slave from Roman Africa, a Latin writer who wrote comedies based on Greek originals, a writer from classical Europe who called himself the African, Afer. Here's how Publius Terentius Afer, whom we know as Terence, writing more than two millennia ago, put it. I am human. I think nothing human alien to me. Homo sum humani nihil ame alienum puto. That is an identity that can bind us all. Thank you very much. So thank you so much. Uh, I'm guessing there will be loads of questions. Just to give me an impression, I have a nice tool to use for you to be able to pose your question, but let me first uh, see how many questions there are. And you can be like this because I'm a little bit near. Okay, good. I know there are philosophers there. Okay, good. I'll start. So I'm going to throw something at you. That's, <laughs> it's a microphone. Yeah. Huh? <laughs> uh, in the example of not knowing that certain types of people exist, uh, the person you named Joe, I think, uh, if Joe would be presented with such people, if he decided to travel with you, do you perhaps think that he might be able to uh, admit that he was wrong and adjust his conception uh, based on the new empirical evidence that would be provided to him? Sure. I mean, that's, I mean, um, I'm aware of an, an important phenomenon in the world today, which is the phenomenon of people who get stuck in a position and then however much evidence you give them, they won't adjust. Uh, that's true about some climate skeptics. But uh, in principle, there's nothing to stop you from 
recognizing that your uh, way of thinking about a certain identity has presuppositions and they're false, right? So uh, a lot of people, uh, perhaps fewer now in the United States than in the past, but a lot of people had presuppositions about how racial terms worked. For example, they presupposed that if you went to a doctor, the doctor could tell you what your race was on the basis of some test, right? Now, uh, that's not something doctors are trained to do because leading biological theorists don't think that's a good way of classifying people. But if you don't know that, you might think, well, I don't know what to say about this case, but there's these experts who do, so you know, send it on to them. Well, your practice, that practice presupposes that there are experts who will answer that question. And if there aren't, then, and you come to learn that, then you have to rethink your... Um, but even if there are, you could still try to rethink it yourself anyway, right? Try to yes, yes, you don't have to. I mean, well, I think that uh, the reason I mentioned semantic deference because I think a lot of people have used racial terms with semantic deference. I think they have thought, because of the cultural authority of the sciences, uh, the, the life sciences, they have thought these are scientific notions. So, of course, I don't know how exactly how they work, but there's somebody who does. Of course, if, it, if the biologist comes to you and says, I'm not going to do this anymore, you, there are various ways you could respond. Uh, one would be to, to, to reclaim the term, abandon the semantic deference, and try to sort out the cases for yourself or, or in company with others. So you could look at all those different kinds of people and ask yourself the question, is there a useful way of categorizing them that doesn't have the presupposition that I've been persuaded is, is false? And yeah, there are different ways to go. But that would then be, um, that you would then be moving, um, the test is whether that move is consistent with counting as being competent with the term in your own language as it currently is, and that requires that you do get, continue to get Bruce Lee right, and that you don't decide that Barack Obama is, is an Asian, right? So there are constraints on how you can move that are set not by experts, but by the kind of shared understanding that grows up in a community about um, about how words work. Okay, I think I go to the next question. Let me see. Yeah. <laughs> uh, thank you so much for the for the talk, Ashley. Um, my question is sort of um, looking at identity politics uh, and these sort of things, and I wonder uh, if there's a way to move beyond identity politically while simultaneously holding on to it socially in order to get the sort of unity that you're speaking about, uh, but avoid the uh, conflict that can arise from it. Okay. I mean, there are um, different kinds of problems with the way identity operates in politics. Uh, one problem is, the, uh, is that overinvestment in certain identities can make it very hard to operate together in a democratic society because you're so polarized I mean, the, the obvious example here is political identities, right? So um, um, I'm not going to talk about the American election. But, <laughs> but Americans are very divided at the moment between Democrats and Republicans and between conservatives and progressives or liberals. Um, and you can't really run a society successfully if about half the population can, contains uh, half the, sorry, if one party contains half it, of its members who literally hate people of the other party and vice versa. And um, that's, that's not a recipe for, for running the ship of state together as a people. Uh, what you need there is a national identity, among other things. Uh, uh, and, what, and, and also you need some ideas about how democracies should work, which include the idea that um, you, 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 you Caring about your country means not winning all the time. It means uh, allowing, the tr making compromises in order that everybody feels that they're getting something, maybe not the same things and maybe not equally, but at least all being considered equally when it comes to... So there are lots of things that I, you favor in, in Dutch politics that you favor not because you have a first-order preference for them, but because you have fellow citizens who care about those things. So. 
Um, maybe you're not very religious, and so you don't care very much about religious freedom, but you want religious freedom for your fellow Dutch people, right? Because some of them do care about religion. Maybe not as many in proportion as Americans do, but still. So I think that's... Um, so, so, um, so identities can overinflate. There's nothing wrong with having an identity as a progressive. There's something wrong with hating everybody who's not progressive. So you, you've got to give them their right place. That's one thing. Um, I think a second thing is that when people... There's a sort of left critique of identity politics which says, wait, you're talking about trans people and black people and women and immigrants and all that, but, you're not, but, but the fundamental problems of our society have to do with economic inequality and you're not talking about class. Well, uh, I share the second part of that critique. I think we should, I don't know enough about Dutch politics, but in my country we don't talk enough about class, we don't think enough about class, and we have pretty incoherent ideas about class. And that stops us from doing something about some very important forms of economic and social inequality in our society that are organized around, not around gender or race or sexual orientation or religion, but around um, um, economic stuff. Is that okay? I, yeah, I or mean, I, so I'm South African, so for, yes. for uh, the most part, I think one of the fundamental issues that we've had in our country is the adherence to uh, racial categories post-apartheid. Um, yes. And from that, we haven't been able to identify the different class uh, issues yeah. that you've... Uh, right. Yeah. I mean, uh, it's going to take a while because, because the, the apartheid system was built over a very long period and many people grew up entirely with it. And, uh, and the category, while the categories that it developed were sort of specific to South Africa, the general process of racial categorization was a global phenomenon. And so the books are full of it. I mean, so, so kind of escaping from it is hard because it's, it's built into structures of thought and, of course, practices. Um, and it's built into the social landscape because, um, you know, parts of Cape Town are colored. And, uh, and so you could abandon, you could stop talking about colored people, as some people have, uh, but if I say the name of that part of Cape Town, what's going to come into people's head is a person who looks a certain way. So I think people sometimes, you know, people think sometimes that the thought that race was socially constructed is a cheerful thought because it means it can be socially deconstructed. Well, that's true, but it doesn't mean it'll be easy. <laughs> it may be very, very hard. Uh, because these things, frankly, I think it's a generational thing. Because once these things are built into your ways of seeing, I sometimes ask my students, uh, can you imagine going on a plane ride, sitting next to somebody, going back to your spouse and saying, I just had a great conversation on the plane with somebody. We had a terrific time and we talked about this, that, and the other. And your spouse says, um, well, was it a white person, a black person, an Asian and you say, oh, I don't know, I didn't notice that, right? Can you imagine, can an American imagine that? Now, there was a time when people could imagine that because they didn't have these categories. And so they saw, they saw skin color, but they saw it as color, not as, a, not as a way of categorizing people. So, and once it's in your brain, in your perceptual system, you can, the only possibility is noticing it and then trying to discount it. It's not it's not not noticing it. You cannot unsee it. So there were two questions more in the back. Are they, did they disappear? Ah, hi, it's go. go. Well, I said thing. Um, I'm gonna try to formulate my question as clear as I can. <clears throat> I've been struggling with my thesis as well uh, because I very happy with uh, choosing freedom as my, my topic, which is uh, very uh, difficult. And I was, um, um, I, I really appreciated your lecture, um, especially you, you said liberal fantasy and the contours of freedom, found those um, very interesting lines. Um, and I was wondering, like, I'm getting constantly 
stuck in like a contradiction of defining freedom um, and uh, with the matter of identity I think if we talk about liberation um, I struggle with um, um, what if, if you can um, if those two things are like Right, so identities... I didn't, yeah, I, I'm not sure. <laughs> no, I think I, I, think I get the point. I think, the, I think what you're asking is... Um, uh, so I've claimed that uh, identities can both get in the way of freedom and they can also be used in processes of liberation. Yes. Well, I think those things are both true, unfortunately. Um, and that means that um, um, so, so here's a thought people have had, right? Uh, identities are doing an awful lot of damage. Race is working with racism. Uh, gender is working with sexism. Homophobia is working with um, gay, lesbian, queer uh, uh, is, is working with homophobia. So why don't we just get rid of identities then we'll get rid of sexism, and racism, and homophobia. Well, the trouble is that um, identities also doing good work. <laughs> Sometimes it's transitional good work. Maybe um, as homophobia disappears, uh, lesbian and gay identities will become thinner and less important. In, in a society that's deeply homophobic, um, gay identities and lesbian identities were incredibly useful in creating forms of solidarity to resist homophobia. But the, the homophobia is gone. And I think it's true. I think, I think my, no, no, I mean, if, if, if it's gone, not, I'm not, <laughs> okay. I'm not asserting it, yeah, but no, it's gone. What I think is really interesting is that I'm, I'm a Buddhist and I, I go to Plum Village every year and there is now a rainbow family there. Yes. And um, identity is like, for me, I think it's a, a, a movement. It's, 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 it's a continuation. It's, it's, not something you can uh, like uh, define yeah. uh, and um, you mean particular identities can't be defined or do you mean yeah yeah because yes. a, a brother um, who was a monk he uh, he was queer and he said well i i practice non-identity because i'm a buddhist but i <laughs> am gay and i found this really interesting and um yeah. So, well, so I, I, I mean, one possibility there is to understand him as having said, um, well, uh, as I mentioned, um, different societies construct different identities out of the, as it were, raw material of sexuality. And, um, but that's a dialectical process. That is to say, the, the raw material of sexuality is shaped by what the available concepts are. Uh, if you don't have the concept gay, you can't be gay, right? You can be a man who's attracted to men, but that's not the same thing as being gay. That's, that's just, as it were, a fact about you. Um, and one possibility is that what he's saying is, it's a fact about me that I desire men, but I don't, I don't want to build an identity around that, right? Um, that's one strategy that um, Catholic priests who are not going to have sex with anybody, least officially, um, could adopt in relation to their sexuality. They could say, I'm not, going to, I'm not going to think of myself as heterosexual, I'm not going to think of myself as homosexual, I'm just, I'm going to, I've given my, uh, my, sex, my sex life is, is something that I've uh, given to the church or to God, um, and so I don't need a, gender, uh, a sexuality identity. But a perfectly available other strategy is to accept that you are what we now call gay, but say, that's what I'm giving to the church. I'm, I'm not going to live that. Yeah, just young children. Okay, so, um, please, and then after that, you. Okay. Sorry? All right, okay. I guess I'm but we have some other questions here. Uh, so thank first. you very much for this talk. I really enjoyed it. So I hope you. Hi. Uh, yeah. you <laughs> Good. Um, uh, I guess uh, it's a little bit, I suppose, going off of what uh, you've answered in the last question. 
um, about these identities that are formed in in opposition or in tension. So uh, gay and lesbian identity, queer identities coming uh, out of a, a need to create solidarity uh, in, in uh, situations with with homophobia. And I, I'm thinking of another example after the, the first Trump election in 2016, uh, in 2017 with the, the um, various uh, Islamophobic uh, Muslim bans, uh, Arab Americans wanted to be recognized as a racial category on the census. Um, and I'm just curious uh, because it, it seems like identity, as you're talking about it, is a very individual affair. Um, but I feel like in many cases, uh, the creation of census categories, laws uh, that create um, you know, um, citizenship based on descent uh, rather than um, yeah, who, who's born in a country or that are based on black-white binaries as in the, the history of the United States, um, it, it's not really a choice. Uh, and I, 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 Bernadine Everest still wrote about this in Manifesto, all of the different identities that that she has, but she said nobody's going to nobody's going to say like, oh, I can be Irish, a white Irish person. Um, I'm always going to be seen as black. Um, and so I'm just curious if you could speak a little bit to some of the like structural ways in which identity is imposed on people, uh, rather than it being something uh, of a kind of subject formation, or maybe how it's that's in conversation. Right. Okay. Creating a subject. Continuation of the freedom team. So, yes. Yeah, yes. I have two more questions here. So yeah. Okay, um, so um, I didn't mean to suggest, in fact, I was resisting the thought that people could just, as it were, do what they like with their identities. Th that's what I meant by saying they're a social possession. The, the, what you can do with your identity is one of the things that's socially negotiated and fixed. And um, so, so, so I, I don't mean deny that and I think that we should think of identities as I mean Taylor Charles Taylor speaks of them as dialogical because my individual uh, identity the kind of the way I package together all the social identities with my projects and so on to make my individuality is never just up to me it's always negotiated um, that's one of the ways in which they're social these identities so what you're permitted to do um, is, however, something that you could seek to negotiate. So there are black Irish people. I mean, um, I mean, Conor Cruz O'Brien, who, who was a distinguished Irish intellectual and foreign minister and um, United Nations uh, representative and so on, uh, author of a great book on Edmund Burke, um, uh, was in the early 60s, um, vice chancellor of the University of Ghana at the invitation of Kwame Nkrumah, and he adopted a Ghanaian kid. And so young O'Brien is a black Irish person, as far as I can tell. Uh, now, that had to be made possible, right? It wasn't, when, he, when, he, when he went back home, uh, when he was, went to Ireland, uh, that wasn't clearly possible. So that's something that's developed. Uh, as some people in Ireland have changed their minds about the relationship between race and identity. But he couldn't have done it on his own. He couldn't have just walked through down a Market Street in Dublin and said, I'm Irish uh, uh, in 1965, right? People would have said, excuse me? What you know, are you what saying mean? even? Yeah. yeah. So I, I think there's room for one, maybe a second question. Tish was uh, up there. I have the impression I forgot yeah, so someone there. Thank you for the lecture. I have a short clarificatory question about prototypes. So is this a representation that somebody like Joe Kansas has, or is this a concept that you use to talk about identity? It's a concept that I'm using to talk about the way identity language works in his community. So, but, so he doesn't have the concept of a prototype. What he does have is an idea that if somebody produces... Um, uh, Bruce Lee and looks at him and asks him where he comes from and then says, oh, he's not Asian, what he has is the thought that person doesn't know what they're talking about, that they're, they're, they're not using the word Asian the way I am. So he, he has examples and also similarly, you know, if, 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 if you produce Dr. King or 
uh, someone like that, uh, he's going to say, no, if you think that's Asian, you've got a mistake. Unless you have some story, tell me the story. Uh, uh, but if you just look at them and say they're Asian, he's going to say, you're not using my... So, that's, so that will... And everybody in his community is going to be like that, right? They're going to have people that everybody agrees is Asian, and they're going to have people everybody agrees are not Asian. But there'll be lots of people which they won't... Um, there may not be any in their community of people that they won't be able to do that with, but there are people in the world, perhaps unbeknownst to them, that they won't be able to do that with. Okay, yeah, clear. Thank you. Thanks so much. So, um, while you were speaking, I was trying to figure out the underlying, I think it's also been a bit addressed, the underlying notion of freedom that you're working with, and it seems to be, if you're thinking of living well, there seems to be something about what identities make possible for you and also what uh, your possibilities of action if society is responsive in the ways you intend to. And, but I was thinking, with identities, it also seems to be the case that they cannot be used pragmatically that easily, which you're also pointing to. They're not only a, an individual toolbox. And when I think of identities, there seems to be this, um, first of all, a power differential in who determines the, the meaning or the sense of the identity. Maybe society has m more structural power always in determining an identity than a particular individual, even though they are a social possession. And also, maybe now we think we want identities to allow for internal difference and allow for change over time. So but they're also usually thought of as something fixed, as something that is determined. So that, doesn't that speak against the political use uh, or the emancipatory use of identities if there's this structural power differential and also this notion of identity as something fixing or um, unchangeable? Well, um, <laughs> I think uh, the... I mean, the PowerPoint is important, not, I think, in quite the way you said, because it's really that um, it's not just that, as it were, society has more control than the individual. It's that there are uh, groups within society that, that drive the dynamic of um, identity. So um, uh, in, in debates about national identity, it's typically the case that native-born people feel entitled to make pronouncements that non-native-born people don't. Now, that isn't true everywhere because there are settler societies where people understand that citizenship is citizenship, and it doesn't distinguish between uh, native-born and um, acquired citizenship, and that therefore everybody, but whether they were born or but in many places, I mean, it certainly seemed to me true in England when I was growing up that, that as it were, or, well, or in France, right? The Français de Souche, the deep, the deep French, get to say more about these things than than the Maghrebi second-generation Maghrebi born in France, but with these connections elsewhere. The sociology of identities should in part be about tracing these structures, but the liberatory possibility arises when recognizing these structures, we think about ways of undoing, um, not so much or not just the, um, the, the unequal distribution of, of power in the game, but the negative ways in which that power is used to limit the possibilities of people. I mean, the liberal thought about freedom is, I think, that really a thought about, um, as it were, it's your life, right, to live. Your life doesn't belong to your family, it doesn't belong to your church, it doesn't belong to your society. It's, as it were, your life. But figuring out the meaning of that, which is a kind of metaphorical thing, because it's using the language of property, um, is, is part of the history of liberalism. It's trying to figure out what it is for people to be in charge of their own lives. Um, granted that, society requires that not everybody can do everything whenever they want, right? Um, and so, but, but I think in relation to identity, the thought is that, um, the, the liberal thought about identity is, identities enable things 
uh, in individual lives. They also enable collective things. They enable forms of solidarity that can be used for various purposes. But, um, but we want people to have control of their own lives. So that must mean something like this, that they have at least a role to play in determining the meaning for them of the, of the identities that are available. They can't just declare things because it's a social possession and we have to negotiate it. But we should pay attention. Everybody who has a certain identity, we should pay attention to their claims about what it does and doesn't do for them and what they need in order to live their lives and, and give weight to their concerns. But giving weight to their concerns is not the same as just doing whatever they want. Right? Uh, if we have, if we view uh, identity then as something that is a conception that other people have about you as a person, I personally mind what's referred to, it's just like assuming a mask where someone thinks you are a certain way and you present yourself as such and that changes between like social groups and that like, so basically your identity also always changes between these social groups. Do you suppose there can be such a thing as a true identity, something that wouldn't change between social groups and that is always true, regardless of where you go and who you speak to? Something that would maybe then be from within you and not from others? There's a picture of identity which I think comes from romanticism, which is the idea of turning inwards and finding the real self. And that, that goes with the picture of authenticity as living a life in which that real self is expressed. I think that presupposes a kind of false anthropology. I don't think that there is antecedently to one's interactions with other people and one's life in society. I don't think there is an answer to be discovered just by turning inwards. The, the cases that make that look attractive as a model are cases like the gay case, as we now understand it, where someone says, um, as it were, I looked inwards and discovered this is what I desire. But, uh, as I said, uh, what, you, what, what you actually discover, right, is that you desire him, right? Framing that as homosexuality, that's something your society gave you as an option. You could say, I just desire him. And, uh, and you could, as it were, feel it wasn't important to settle the question of what that meant about anybody else. I, I, I desire him. I'm, I'm, that's, that's what I'm doing. I mean, I might feel like this about my husband. I might think, it doesn't matter anymore who else I might desire, right? Because we've been doing this desiring thing together for the last 45 years or something, and, and uh, nobody else really matters to it, right? Now, of course, that means that I count as gay in my society. Uh, in the 18th century, I would have counted as a sodomite. That's a different thing. A sodomite is not a gay person. A sodomite is someone who um, has forms of sex that are prohibited by canon law, <laughs> uh, and so on. So. Um, so I think the sort of romantic picture, while charming, misses the fact that uh, w what's there is always already to some degree formed by our interactions with others. I mean, of course there's something there, and there's the scientific study of the question why it is that some people find themselves drawn to sex with one kind of person, and some people find themselves drawn to sex. And, 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 the scientific study of that is the study of something that, as it were, exists before you're socialized. But once you're in the business, once you're, as it were, old enough to have a language and to be thinking about who you are, it's too late to talk about just looking inwards and finding what's there. Um, now, I, so I understand why that picture of authenticity can seem attractive. Yes, yeah. Okay. I think that's an excellent way to decide this uh, evening on a very controversial topic. I agree with you. <laughs> and uh, let's uh, all thank uh, Professor Kwame Paya for this uh, talk. Thank you. Thank you. 